Okay. Hello. Thank you, Jason. So I am Marie Goodfellow. Uh, this summer I worked at the Children's Hospital in Colorado out in Aurora in orthopedic research. So a little bit about the hospital. Uh, Children's a world-renowned facility. Uh, it's a beautiful building, with cute little butterflies and everything for the kids. Uh, they treat really any field. Um, if your child is sick in Colorado or even around the nation, this is one of the first places you come. Uh, there are top 10 in many fields such as diabetes and endocrinology, uh, others including orthopedics, which is where I worked. The building itself had almost 1.5 million square feet with 284 beds and ongoing research in just about every field. So my project, obviously there's a lot that could be done here, but what I was focusing on were these lovely things here. Uh, so these are super condylar fractures. They're pretty common in kids. In fact, they're one of the most common pediatric fractures. And they're especially common because children's bones are still growing. So children frequently have an outstretched arm on the monkey bars on the playground. They fall on that arm and then it breaks right at the growth plate, just above the elbow joint and splits. And these are classified into different levels of severity. Uh, right here we had a type three, so a relatively severe fracture. And once that splits, if it's left alone, there can be some pretty serious complications. So to treat that, doctors put these pins in for about a month or two just to hold everything together while the arm's in a cast. And then using a pair of needle nose pliers, you just pull them out <laughs> once the kid's doing a little bit better. The kids really don't like that. I saw that a few times. Did not go well. <laughs> but then everything should be healed back together pretty well. Uh, you can see some of the sites where the pins were, but for the most part, there's been significant remodeling. So these are some of the complications that you can expect from supracondylar fractures. This is why it's so important to treat them properly and to treat them promptly. We have up here some ischemia, so this muscle is so swollen because the blood isn't able to make its way around that fracture that you can actually have tissue loss in this patient. You could also have a permanent contracture or even limb length discrepancies like we see over here in this young man who probably had a supracondylar fraction as a child. And now he has two different limbs of different sizes and lengths. So it can cause a lot of problems if you don't treat them well. So what I was doing for this was not treating supracondylar fractures, um, but rather looking at the electronic medical records surrounding these fractures. It's very important that doctors look at different categories when they treat them because if they miss something, that could be very bad for the child, for the patient, um, and also for the hospital down the road. So if a child comes in two weeks after surgery and can't feel their fingers, we don't know if that was a mistake during the surgery or if it's just a result of the injury. So looking at the electronic medical records, this was our mission statement. We were hoping to compare the quality of documentation for supracondylar fractures, both before and after the implantation of a template, which was designed to record the common problems that were associated with this fracture. And this is that said template. So what I was doing was entering a lot of data over the summer. Um, I filled out a template looking just like this for every visit that each patient came in. And that could be four visits at a minimum, maximum of 10, looking at the important vascular, sensory, and motor areas that doctors need to be checking when these patients come in. So all in all, that was 735 patients uh, with about 3,500 individual visits, which for me amounted to about 8,000 entries of data. Lots of fun times there. But we also analyzed that data and then went on to uh, write a paper. So here's some of the results that we saw in that data set. So all of the red, those are the areas which in each of those checkpoints, the vascular, motor, and sensory areas that the doctors needed to be checking to make sure everything was right with the patient. Those red areas are how often it was complete in that exam. So before this template was put in place, we were about seeing 10% of exams, including all of the necessary vascular information. That's not very good. Um, that opens the hospital up to a lot of legal liability, and that doesn't tell us that the patient's getting the check they need. So after putting this template in, in the vascular area, we saw a rise of 85% of exams holding this information that their presentations and that their uh, exams should have shown. And overall, we saw the significant differences in all of the areas between the post and pre-template groups, and we had an odds ratio of 115. So that means that it was 115 times more likely for a patient to receive a complete exam when this template was being used. So highly significant results. And we went on to write a paper that's actually under consideration for publication right now, and I get to be really cool and have my name as the third person on the document in front of a few doctors. Um, but we're waiting to hear back on whether or not this will be published in a trauma journal. So anxiously awaiting those results. So other adventures and takeaway. Um, when I wasn't entering data in front of my computer, I got to do some really cool shadowing around the hospital. I spent a day in uh, the OR, the operating room, 
here's my selfie from that day, as well as the emergency room uh, with nurse practitioners, physical therapist. Uh, I followed around my own doctor, my, present, my uh, site supervisor for a few days as well. We had other interns from all over the nation, um, from Vanderbilt, a few from California, who were great to talk with and were having a similar experience. We also got to do a lot of hiking and just explore Denver. And so the impact that this has had on my life, um, going into this internship, I was relatively sure that I wanted to do something in medicine. Coming out of this internship, I do not want to go into medicine. <laughs> so I wasn't expecting that one. Um, it was a great experience. I loved being able to watch all of the doctors. But at no point did I think, I want to be doing that. Uh, so after six years of mock trial competition, I finally come to the realization that law school may actually be something I'm interested in, not just something I tamper with for fun. And right now, um, I'm applying to the Peace Corps. I actually should be hearing back any day now. And I'm also applying to jobs in the US Forest Service as a park ranger and possibly taking law school eventually. We'll see. Um, but regardless, this was a phenomenal experience for me. I learned so much from the doctors, from my site mentors, from all these people that were very focused on providing the best care they could to the children that came through their doors. So a huge thanks to my site mentor, my faculty mentor, Mar Marty Condon, and the other doctors at the hospital, including Nancy Miller and Ju Cao, who could not be here today. Thank you.